Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and today I have Paula Braxton, author of the New York Times bestseller, The Witch's Daughter, and now the author of the new book, The Little Shop of Found Things. The audio on this interview is a little spotty in places, but it was so interesting to hear Paula talk about how she picks her characters' names, how she uses language to set a tone, and how she got her first novel published and now juggles working on multiple books at once that I decided to go with it. But do know that I've already made changes so my future interviews will sound better. And now, here's the interview. Hi, Paula. Thanks for being with me today. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Oh, we're delighted to have you. So can you start by telling our listeners about the new book? Well, the new book is called The Little Shop of Found Things. Um, It's set in Wiltshire, which is um, a county in England, for those of you that don't know. Um, And it's a very rural, ancient county full of um, standing stones and chalk hill figures and ley lines and ancient buildings and a lot of history, which is one of the things that appealed to me. And in this uh, county, there's a town called Marlborough, which is a little market town. And the main character, Xanthi, and her mother, Flora, go to Marlborough to take on um, a, an antique shop, which they've bought. Um, they've got quite a, a difficult past and they're starting again and they buy this antique shop. And it's it's a bit run down and full of old things that may or may not be worth anything. <laughs> and this is going to be their new start and their new business. They've been in the antiques trade a long time, but they've left their London life behind. Um, so Xanthi has a special gift in that if she holds certain objects, she can detect things about them. It's called psychometry. She can sense um, a little bit of their history. Um, and, and her mother is always called this, that the, the things sing to her. So even when she was a child, she would pick up certain antiques and get things about their past from just holding them. Mm. Um, so sometimes she finds objects that sing to her. And when she moves to the new um, house, she finds that this uh, gift becomes much stronger. And in the back garden, she discovers a little stone building. I don't want to give too much away, but it's a very important building for Xanthi. Mm -hmm. And when she takes the uh, particular objects to this little building, um, she can actually move back in time to the point of the origin of the piece and where its story is. And that's how she finds herself transported back in time, in this case to 1605. So there are two stories running together, one in the in the present day and with her new life with her mum uh, and the new antiques business and all the people she meets in the town. And the other one where she has to go back to 1605 and solve a mystery um, which is attached to a chatelaine. Um, I don't know how many of your readers will know that a chatelaine is like a, a silver clasp or belt worn by um, the lady of the house, and it would have things hanging from it, like um, scissors or needles, um, maybe a, a small purse for coins, that sort of thing. Um, and this object, which is now a very valuable antique, um, has a story to it, and she has to sort out that mystery. Wonderful. Yes, I had heard the word chatelaine, but I actually didn't know what it was. So I appreciated that you, in the book also, you had explained <laughs> what it was. <laughs> it's uh, in, in the United States, at least, it was, um, I mean, I was on a, a dance squad in junior high called the Chatelaines. <laughs> so oh, right. that was, yeah, I don't, I don't, and I never knew the origin of why it was called that, but that was the first thing it called to mind. So it was very well, different. <laughs> Yeah, I think in France originally it means the lady of the house. Um, it, the chatelaine has the the, char- the charge of the house, and it very often have keys on it. Ah, so oh, okay. Where it came from, but as the centuries went on, it became more of a, a decorative thing. People would have very expensive. You can find beautiful ones, um, which were worn more as an, an accessory or a piece of jewelry. But uh, the one that Xanthi finds is because it's it's quite an early one, and it is much more um, practical, really. Yeah, and and from your accent, I know you obviously live in the um, in the UK somewhere. Um, yeah, in Wales. In Wales, oh, lovely! And the town you're writing about is it is it real? And have you visited it? It is real, and I have visited a few times. Um, I, I chose Wiltshire partly because it, it's a beautiful old county, but also because it's not too far from where I live <laughs> compared to America. Obviously, the UK is very small. Wales is a separate country, but in two and a half hours, I can be in Wiltshire. Oh, wonderful. It, it, must, it must be so wonderful be, to be surrounded by so much history and ancient history, you know, so much more so than than we have. Well, I live in Nevada, so we have, you know, the, uh-huh. the Wild West history, but it's not yeah. not quite the same. 
<laughs> it is it is lovely and because I love history it's a gift for me as a writer there's so much to write about and and one of the things that inspired me to do this series was I, I like the idea that with each book there will be a new object a new found thing um, and that will take Xanthi back in time and that I just that idea of being able to actually travel back to the past so interests me yeah. um, I mean that's I think why we read and write historical fiction anyway <laughs> so this is just like the next the next level if you like right and I was going to ask this is the first book in a series is that right mm-hmm. It is. So um, there will be like a contained story within each book, but the series is a continuing series. So you'll meet Xanthi and her mum and the the characters in the present day um, and sometimes in the past, depending when and where she's going, will continue through further books as well. So I've just finished writing um, the second draft of book two, um, and hopefully that will be out about this time next year. So yeah, it is a continuing series. Nice. Isn't it funny how w- when your book launches, you're already well into the next one? It is, when you, <laughs> you know, I have to try and remember what's in which book and who and where, and I rely on my readers to keep me, you know, <laughs> keep me up to date. It's easier with a continuing series, obviously, because at least it is the same um, set of characters. But yeah, it is. It is a little complicated. Right. Well, I was actually going to ask you this later, but since you brought it up, you also write another series about the Brothers Grimm. Well, it's the series is about Detective Gretel, um, and each of the books has a, a, a pun on a, on, a, on a, a fairy tale. So the first one is um, uh, the case of the missing frog prince, spelled P R I N T S, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. and as you say it's a sort of pseudo eighteenth century Bavaria. Um, they are really good. A hyphenated thing. They are comic crime fantasy historical novels. <laughs> <laughs> and they're called the Brothers Grimm Mysteries. Yeah, and, and they tend to build the Brothers Grimm um, fairy tales, but fairly loosely. <laughs> yes. So what's it like to, do you work on both of the series simultaneously or do you, what's it like to try to work on two series at the same time? Um, I try and be at different stages with the book. So and, and that sort of happens quite naturally, actually. I mean, I find that I'm probably deeply in the, the sort of first big draft of one book. Um, at the same time, I might be soon coming up to edits of an earlier book, and I might be promoting the book before that. So I'm not actually writing two books at the same time. I may be working on different series and different books, but I'm the activities are different enough that you keep them quite separate. But I, there is a shift between... The biggest challenge for me is the shift in tone, the tone of the books, um, because the the Detective Gretel books are crime and they're satire and they're you know they're quite sharp and they're comedic, um, and the tone of my other historical fiction is much more intimate and um, maybe dramatic in those sort of ways. So it's keeping that tone in its right place. (laughs) That's the challenge. (laughs) Yes. And let's get to the language because in the little shop of found things, the language Mm -hmm. is what immediately jumped out at me from the first page. I mean, you use comprise Mm -hmm. properly and you use the word (laughs) trod. And I I just want to read a couple of sentences to give the listeners a sense of it. Um, This is Mm -hmm. the very beginning of the book. So it goes, it's a commonly held belief that the most likely place to find a ghost is beneath a shadowy moon among the ruins of a castle, or perhaps an abandoned house where the living have fled, leaving only spirits to drift from room to room. To believe so is to acknowledge but half a truth, for there's a connection with those who passed over to be found much nearer home. Every soul that once trod this brutal earth leaves their imprint upon the things that mattered to them." So I, I so I, I hope people can get a sense of how rich and slightly unusual the language is. So can you talk about how you think about using language to set the scene and develop your characters? And since there's time travel in the book, to give a sense of different times. I mean, the, the language seems really important to this book. Um, I guess as a writer, that's that's my my tool. The language is my tool, and the, what I'm trying to do with it is to give the reader a real experience, as real as possible, uh, to a place or to somebody's thoughts or to an experience. And I think you have to use language that helps you with that. Um, I mean, it, I took quite a risk with the, the, the way that the point of view shifts at the beginning of the first book because um, we have the ghost, and it's not a spoiler to tell you that at the beginning of the book, 
you, you, you meet a ghost quite early on. And we're seeing things through her eyes and then we change to Xanthi. And sometimes we go backwards, but mostly we stay with Xanthi after that. But I wanted the ghost in the beginning because I wanted to use that sort of language. Um, for me, that, that historical feeling to things comes through in the language. When, when I'm writing 1605, obviously people speak very differently. Right. <laughs> I couldn't have them speaking exactly as they would have done because it would be quite hard work for the reader. So I have a stylized version, if you like. Um, and it's the same when I'm doing the descriptive writing, whether it's in the present day or the past. I'm trying to give a flavor of that time, a sense of something other, something historical, something different. And I think you can't really do that with using everyday words too much. That's going to be there in the dialogue with the present day characters. Um, and hopefully that will help modern readers to connect with the characters. But the other language is there to make it a, like a virtual reality, if you like, coming off the page. That's my aim. So does writing <laughs> writing historical fiction and using sort of the semi-historical language, does that just come natural mm -hmm. to, to you? Or is it something that you have to sort of research and work on? Um, I do do a lot of research for my books, even though they're fantasy, you know, they have fantasy elements to them. Obviously, the, the real stuff has to be authentic, it has to be accurate. So I do research stuff. But I think you have an ear for language, or you don't. Um, I think actors probably think about this, writers too. Um, you, I mean, I watch a lot of movies, I listen to a lot of plays on the radio, I go to the theatre, I'm a fan of opera, I read historical novels, and I think you just absorb patterns of speech. Um, and ways of putting language together that feels archaic or arcane. Um, so it does come naturally once I'm in that book, and it's largely driven by the characters. Once I can hear the voice of the character myself, I know how they would phrase a, a, a reply to something, or I know how they would see something and how they'd think about it. So that really helps me to find the right words then. Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll hear how Paula came up with Xanthi's name, how she got her first novel published, and what it took to become a full-time writer. But first, I'm doing a webinar on AP Style in a couple of weeks, February 28th. It's a 90-minute class for beginning and intermediate writers who need to know AP Style for work. It's live with time for questions at the end, and you can watch it alone or with your whole team. And it's also recorded, so you can watch it again later. Sign-up information is in the pinned tweet on my Twitter account, Grammar Girl, and it's also going out in my email newsletter, which you can sign up for at quickanddirtytips.com. Also, we've just launched the third season of our Quick and Dirty Tips history show, Unknown History, and I encourage you to check it out. This season is all about D-Day, the day when Allied forces invaded France during World War II. Best-selling historian Giles Milton shares thrilling stories from fighters and witnesses on all sides of the conflict. It's a really great show, and I think you'll love it. Find Unknown History wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, back to Paula Braxton. And I'm curious, how did you come up with Xanthi's name? I've, I've never heard that name before. Oh. <laughs> um, well... This is my 12th published book. Um, so you, you get through a lot of names. <laughs> you, you have to come up with, it, it's great in the beginning, you just put your favorite ever names in, and then you have to try and avoid names that sound like other names. You have to avoid names that begin with the same letters in the same book if you can. Um, you, then you find that you have friends or people, neighbors, or, and you think, oh, I don't use that, they'll think it's them. Um, and then when I was writing a lot of um, Welsh names, they had to be principal, or for old-fashioned names, they had to be ones that people would, would be comfortable saying. Um, having said that, Xanthi's quite tricky. I think it might trip a few people up. Um, I don't know. I, I wonder, what do you think? How many people will be able to pronounce it without checking it out? Well, yeah, <laughs> well, I, thought, I wasn't sure. I thought it might be Xanth. I thought that you might be silent. I, I, and I was wondering if it was a, a real name from another language or if you had made it up out of whole cloth. <laughs> I love that. I love when people can't tell when I'm making things up. That's that's a really good sign for me. <laughs> Sometimes I forget too. No, it's I think it's Greek, um, and it's uh, maybe somebody will correct me on that, but I'm pretty sure it is. No, I think it means something like the golden one. 
Um, and I just like the sound of it. I like the look of it on the page. I like the fact that it wasn't going to get muddled up with anybody else. Nobody else would begin with an X. <laughs> and it's unusual enough that it adds to the sort of magical feel of the story too. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. And it, and it suits her. Her mother is quite an unusual person. I think she would have chosen quite an unusual name. Yeah. Oh, good point. So I saw that um, among your previous jobs, you had been an English teacher. I was wondering if, mm -hmm. um, if what were your major takeaways from that and if any of that has served you in your writing? Um, I was an English teacher. English is a foreign language. So uh -huh. we're not talking literature or, or, or um, you know, like high school English. I was teaching people who didn't speak English <laughs> to mm. speak English. Um, and the beauty of that was it really made you look at the value of every word, particularly when you're teaching beginners. Um, you have to really justify every word you use or it's just white noise. You'll know if you've learned a language yourself. <laughs> um, I then John taught uh, creative writing at, um, at the university here at the University of Wales in Newport. So I then had a chance to really take apart how we write and, and why we write and what people are trying to do when they're writing. So I've had those two different teaching experiences, and I suppose both of them have really, as I say, the great thing is they teach you to really look at what you're doing and justify stuff and think about it. Wonderful. I'm always really curious about people's careers and how they develop. So I, can, can you talk about sort of how, did you have a lucky break? What was, what was it that allowed you to become a full-time novelist? Um, I was one of those overnight successes that takes about 10 years. <laughs> um, I've been trying to get a novel published for a long time. I wrote short stories and articles and things like that. And, and I was also did an MA in creative writing. I had small children, so I was, you know, beginning a family at the same time. And I just kept going. <laughs> and eventually my, my first novel, which was then called The Book of Shadows and later became The Witch's Daughter, um, was picked up by a small publisher in this country and um, put out in a very small <laughs> small way. And it was spotted by um, Peter Wolverton, my editor at, at Thomas Dunn at St. Martin's Press, um, who took it on and we worked on the book together and put it out in America. And it wasn't until two years later that it became a New York Times bestseller. So we're not entirely sure how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> if we knew, we'd do it again. Um, and... Uh, um, so Martin's then bought the rights to all my books, and they're actually my main publisher. It's quite unusual in that, although I, I live in Britain, my main publisher is in America. So my British sales are actually foreign rights for me. Um, <laughs> everything goes through America. That is I odd. I do <laughs> fashion. It's rather odd. Um, so I built, I, I wrote another book, The Winter Witch came next, and um, the, uh, the Midnight Witch, and The Silver Witch, and The Return of the Witch. Um, so I kept writing my witch books, and at the same time I was developing my Detective Gretel Brothers Grimm series. Um, they're published by Pegasus Books, which is another American publisher. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess it just built one book upon another, really. I mean, obviously it helped having the success of uh, The Witch's Daughter. Um, and building up a readership that I felt I was writing for, which gave me, you know, a focus for my books. Um, and I did take a decision to not each other, you know, about the second or third book. Um, and it's great. It's great to be able to immerse myself in it full time. And that's why with the new series, I really wanted to do something with quite a lot of scope to it so that I could keep going. <laughs> so that's what I like to do. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, all, all you aspiring writers out there, take note. You just keep trying. <laughs> keep trying. Nine years before I have my first novel published. <laughs> but, you know, you, you, you don't know. If you give up, you'll, you'll never know. Just, you know, be persistent and be passionate. You know, really put your passion onto the page because it shines through in your writing, definitely. Yeah. So do you have to travel to the United States very often then if your publishers are all here? No, I've never been. I'm, never? I'm, 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 Strange. No, I don't fly well. Um, I don't, uh, so I, I don't know. And, and it's, uh, you know, all those people who say, do I need to move to New York to become a writer? Well, no, <laughs> move to Wales. <laughs> Although not all of you. <laughs> not all of you, right. Yeah. I visited Wales. It's delightful. And maybe oh, maybe, maybe someday you can take a, a, a cruise. You could take a ship to, to New York. Yeah, I guess slowly. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> 
wonderful. Well, you know, the, w- one of the things I was thinking of when I saw that you write the Brothers Grimm mysteries is that mm-hmm. w- one of the brothers, Jacob, did some really interesting work in linguistics. And there's even oh, really? there's even a law named after him called Grimm's Law that um, mm-hmm. just describes how the sounds changed in words over time. So it tells us why words like father and paternal are actually mm-hmm. related. So, you know, he's so they're so no, well known for their fairy tales, but... He was actually also a, a, a very accomplished linguist, and oh, wow. um, they worked on German dictionaries. And so I was, it, it's, oh, it, would, really it, it, it would be completely normal if you didn't know that. It's something that really on, <laughs> only linguists know. But I was wondering if, if you did know, and if you might like work it into your books one day. Oh, well, I, I think if you if you look at my Detective Gretel books, um, she's quite, Gretel is, is quite, um, she has a way with words. I mean, she's quite sharp tongued, um, but she never uses one word where six will do. So it's it's quite a style of writing and a style of speaking. Um, perhaps the uh, Jacob Grimm would be would be proud of that. I don't know. I'll have to check them out. I've only seen the the little shop of found things, but I'm really enjoying it so far. It's it's okay. it's wonderful. So um, we'll finish up that, um, you know, we always ask authors what's their favorite word. And um, mm-hmm. I believe you said Moodle. Can you explain why you love that word? <laughs> well, mo- Moodling, that was the word that I wanted in the dictionary, Moodling, because it's, huh. a, it's a family word. And, and I think I said it before that I was quite surprised to find that it isn't actually a word because our family have always used to Moodle or that we are Moodling. And it just means to sort of consider something in a ruminative chewing it over sort of way um so i do it with my writing i always say i'm now at the moodling stage of a particular book which means i'm just maybe doing a mind map and a bit of brainstorming and just writing loads of stuff down and just just sort of exploring ideas and that's that's moodling wonderful i feel like i've heard the word but it's also the name of um like an online learning platform that teachers use in the united states so yeah. oh, right. hey well there you are <laughs> <laughs> they, knew, they knew the value of moodling too. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So thank you so much. So the new book is The Little Shop of Found Things. It's wonderful. Um, and why don't you tell people where they can find you? I understand you have a YouTube channel and, and other places. I'm, I'm quite, despite being on a different continent, I'm actually quite hard to avoid. You can find me on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. If you just put my name in on YouTube, you'll find it. And the videos that I do are about my books, so you'll know if there are giveaways coming up, you'll know what new releases are coming out. It's also about the background to the books, how I write, um, and there, if you're keen on writing as well, there are videos specifically aimed at people who are writing. So it's some of the um, workshops that I've done for, for writers are in the videos. Um, I have a Facebook page, so do check in and, and have a look on that. That, that again, has some um, news of, of what I'm up to on there and just insights into my writing shed. I am sitting in my writing shed now. It's Hi. tiny and it's on the side of the mountain and the cat's on the windowsill, mercifully being still. Um, and I have a website. Um, Detective Gretel does have a Twitter account. So if you look for Detective Gretel on Twitter, that, that's me. But I do tweet as Gretel. So I'm in character when I'm tweeting, um, which I have some fun with just about everywhere. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. All of it is so different. <laughs> well, and, and again, if you're searching for it, the name is Paula Braxton, B-R-A-C-K-S-T-O-N. So go find Paula online and, and watch those YouTube videos and follow along with Detective Gretel. Um, thanks again, Paula, for being here with me today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. Thanks for listening. Bye.